Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, we are here in Houston, Texas, and I'm happy to report to my friends that are watching us up along the Red River, down in the Rio Grande River, the coastal bend to the Big Bend, to the high plains of Texas, to the Rio Grande Valley. We survived. Uh, we had the, uh, what was it called? Ni uh, Nicholas. 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 Yeah. Uh, Buenos dias a todos. Tropical Andrea Gomez. <laughs> Tropical Storm Nicholas, and, uh, and then became Hurricane, and then back to tropical storm then back to a depression but, but yes it was horrible it this, was it was raining this is the indomitable <laughs> andrea gomez la dama de colombia now tejana living in texas uh so welcome to the program this is our weekly tlc live and we want to welcome you we got an exciting show today we got a couple of guests one in uh, austin texas uh he is our dear friend uh, from the Texas Public Policy Foundation. We're going to be talking about a handful of the bills that went into effect September 1st, because as you know, after the legislative session, new bills generally go into effect September 1st or at the beginning of the year. So we're going to talk about laws passed in the Texas legislature and what the legislature is up to now. And then we're going to go down the I-35 corridor and we're going to invite a dear friend who's running for state representative in a special election in the southern part and the northeast sliver of San Antonio Bear County. So we're going to have him on later. But um, for Andrea, Latinos in the show, and yeah. today, September 15, yeah. it's uh, started, yeah. it's Empieza, the Hispanic Heritage Month, till October 15. So so what are we going to do to we're celebrate? Celebrating. We're celebrating. We're, we're going to drink French, California, and Argentinian wines. Uh, French, California, and Argentina. Okay, whatever. Well, we can, we can drink tequila. California is full of We Hispanic. can drink tequila, I think, because also yeah, independ Mexican tequila, Independence no. Day. Maybe a Cuba Libre. <laughs> <laughs> Cuba Libre mean? sounds good, too. So let's jump right into uh, a couple of the issues that were passed or some of the laws, legislation, statutes, whatever you want to call them in the Texas legislature this year. And, of course, our friends on the left, the extreme left, because that's what they are, already apoplectic. They're already going off the rails. They're already trying to use the old platitudes of, you know, we're going back in time or we're turning the hands, the, uh, the, the clock back, you know, all of those things. So uh, to go over some of the bills, we're going to introduce our dear friend Rafa Behar, uh, also, a fellow Cubano immigrant, but uh, as you can see with his big old 10-gallon Texas hat, he is a full-fledged Texan now living in uh, in Austin, Texas. So, Andrea, vas a introducir a Rafa. Claro, mi querido Rafa, bienvenido de nuevo. Qué bueno tenerte de nuevo en el show, finalmente. Es un gran placer para estar de nuevo con ustedes. It's a, a pleasure to be back on the show with, uh, with y'all. And uh, just a clarification, uh, I was actually born in Texas. I was born in oh. Corpus. So, uh, so yes, my parents are Cuban, but I was 100% um, uh, uh, Texan, born in, born in Corpus. And uh, Pero I work in Austin. Pero todavía tienes el acento cubano. Pero eso no se, <laughs> eso no, eso eso no, no se pierde nunca. Pero eso no se pierde. But Rafa, he doesn't understand. If you're born of Cuban parents, doesn't matter where you're born, you're still Cuban. That's absolutely correct. That's 100% <laughs> That's correct. like my daughter. She's born in Houston, Texas, but she'll tell people, oh, I'm soy cubana. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, all right, let's get right into it. Um, first of all, I want to compare the difference uh, so that our viewers can see how calm, cool, and collected we are discussing legislation and changes to statutes uh, in Texas, how we conservatives approach things. Uh, and then I want you to see how the far left approaches things. So we're going to roll a little tape of our local county judge who has no government experience, uh, and she's being led by Washington consultants to whip people up. So if uh, Mark will roll the tape, here we go. Terrible bills are becoming law in the state of Texas. They are taking important issues to the very extreme on the wrong end of things. They're taking this state back in time, and here's how. They're encouraging intimidation of voters at the ballot box, like the days of Jim Crow. They're allowing pretty much anybody to carry a gun openly, no permitting, no training, just like the Wild West. And they're gagging teachers in how they teach about race. 
like back in the day when we all had to pretend like racism wasn't a thing. So there you have it, Oops. Andrea. That's, uh, you know, that's how the left uh, is describing what's happened in the legislature. So we're going to take them one by one and sort of walk, walk you through them and why they were introduced in the legislature, why they were passed, and why they're good bills. Let's begin with uh, Ms. Uh, Hidalgo's uh, uh, accusation that we're going back to the Jim Crow days where people were not allowed to vote. Now, that was a very sad period in our country. For example, in the 60s, uh, African Americans and even some Hispanics, particularly Mexican Americans in this country, were treated very poorly and were denied the right to vote. In fact, in Mississippi and Alabama, when African Americans tried to go to the courthouse to register to vote, they were literally beaten by the local sheriffs. Uh, it's well documented, and it's a sad period in our country. But as Americans, we've worked hard to correct that, and we want to give everyone, everyone that lives in this country and is eligible to vote, according to the rules, the right to vote. So when we found out that, for example, in South Texas, we had a practice by politiqueras, and these are ladies that are men that are paid, politiqueras, politiqueros, whatever you want to call it, to engage in voter fraud, that is to harvest ballots sent out by the mail. And this isn't just South Texas. This happens in big cities like Houston and San Antonio. Ballot harvesting is a big deal. And so we wanted to put an end to that. We wanted to make sure that your vote counts, that your vote isn't canceled out by a fraudulent vote. So the legislature met to try to enhance the rules about voting. Everybody has rules. Baseball has rules. Soccer has rules. Rodeos have rules. Golf has rules. Well, voting should have rules, too, so that we know that we have some integrity in our election system. So Rafa and Texas Public Policy Foundation were very involved in the voter, what we're calling the voter integrity laws. So Rafa, give us the highlights, if you can, of why this doesn't deny anyone the opportunity to vote but why it makes voting more secure and preserves the integrity of our elections in Texas. Well, I think that you're uh, absolutely right, you know, um, that you know, uh, the election process needs to have rules. And the question is, who sets these rules, right? Who has the authority to set these rules? And what we saw in the last election cycle is that um, the uh, uh, that uh, the Honorable Judge uh, Lena Hidalgo basically made up her own rules, you know, when it came to uh, uh, voting in the last election cycle in Harris County, you know, and she allowed all sorts of things that were not really authorized, you know, in state law. And that's the reason why the Texas legislature came back in a big way to address a lot of these uh, loopholes that needed to be uh, clarified because uh, it is uh, the Texas election uh, rules, and it's not the Harris County election rules. And I think that that's the you know the first thing that needs to be clarified, and goes directly to Miss Hidalgo's uh, uh, point. Now, the um, uh, the Tex the SB one, which is the uh, Texas uh, integrity uh, election integrity uh, bill that became law. I mean, this was the centerpiece in a very um, controversial Texas legislative session. And it was so controversial that the Democrats themselves, talking about the difference between how liberals react and how conservatives react, the, Dem the Democrats themselves basically abdicated their duty and their responsibility to pass law, and they fled the state uh, and uh, to avoid trying to vote on this legislation. Um, and uh, what really doesn't make, um, you know, a lot of sense is, you know, why they why they did that, because what this legislation does, uh, as opposed to all the, you know, the bluster that uh, uh, we saw uh, Miss Hidalgo and the rest of the Democrats, you know, say that this election law uh, makes it easier to vote, but harder to cheat. Uh, and uh, that's that's very important. And uh, and again, despite what they're saying, that this takes us back to the 
you know, the uh, very restrictive era, era of Jim Crow, uh, this actually, this law actually puts things on par with everybody, you know, people that vote, you know, in person and people who vote uh, uh, through uh, mail and ballot. So I'll go uh, very quickly through uh, some of the points and then we can expand on those. Um, and uh, so SB1, uh, uh, the first thing it does is that it bans drive through voting. So I don't know whoever came up with the idea that drive through voting was a good idea, but it's not. Um, Can I pause you for a moment? Sure. I didn't attend a lot of the legislative hearings, but why was the legislature concerned about drive through voting? Sure. So uh, drive through voting is not a good idea uh, because um, voting is not fast food. Uh, and it, it requires, uh, you know, uh, to be able to, uh, 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 number one, there's the secrecy of the vote. So if you're driving through, uh, there's there could be multiple people in the car. That doesn't provide any level of um, privacy or any level of security. Um, and there could be other people in the car that could be influencing that voter to vote. Um, you know, uh, so that's number one. And, uh, you know, there's, you know, uh, just the issue of just just driving through that process. It it makes it, you know, logistically very difficult. So let me ask you accountability before the legislation, someone could rent a 15 passenger van and go collect a bunch of, uh, let's say, elderly people at a retirement home and drive them through the process. And then somebody in the back was yelling at the elderly people, this is how you need to vote and for whom you need to vote. You think there was some intimidation in the van, and so therefore their their ballot is not secret and they're being coached, which is clearly prohibited, right? Absolutely. And that was one of the major concerns. And, you know, we saw this, and this is one of the new uh, innovative uh, methods that, were, that we saw in Harris County, right? And that's, you know, and, and so this is, you know, this is exactly the type of thing that, you know, uh, Miss Hidalgo instituted that we're trying to correct, right? Because, again, this is the Texas election law. This is not the Harris County election law. Yeah, um, so let, me and- re- let me remind everybody that's watching. The electoral process, the rules for voting are promulgated. That means they're passed. They're set by the Texas legislature. It has to pass the House of Representatives and the Texas Senate. It must be signed by the governor. It must be constitutional. The voting rules are not set by the 254 counties in Texas and their concomitant municipalities. The rules are set by the state of Texas, by the people of the state of Texas through their elected representatives. Right. So so that's just one point, and there, there's many others. Uh, some of the others is the... Um, uh, the the new law puts a ban on 24 hour early voting. Uh, again, I don't know who thought it was a good idea to roll up at two o'clock in the morning and try to vote. Uh, you know that is uh, that's not uh, that's not a ideal conditions, right? right. Uh, let me ask you. Let me interrupt you now. Uh, one could argue you have shift workers, for example, in the Houston area, Pasadena. We have we have refineries that operate 24 hours a day. We have hospitals that operate 24 hours a day. We have nurses that get off of ICU at two o'clock in the morning, their shift ends. What's wrong with letting someone vote at 2 a.m.? Well, the the problem is, is it, it, it it's difficult to keep the election um, uh, polling places open all you know 24 hours and, and guarantee security. And uh, the uh, the other point is, is that the way the system is already set up with early voting hours is that although you may have a, uh, a night shift worker or a worker that uh, that uh, or somebody that works in odd hours, but the early voting uh, time period is uh, is very extensive, and that any anybody can find time to vote during the regular operation hours. Okay. Plus, early voting, it goes um, on, on the weekends, too. So yeah, it's, that's, not, that's exactly. it's not an excuse to go in early voting. I mean, these 24 hours and this uh, fast food way to vote, I mean, you, you just literally say right. And I, I'm from Colombia. I never saw something like that. And we make it hard over there to go and vote. And I'm not saying that. Wait, wait, can you repeat that? 
Colombia makes it hard to vote? Yes. Why? Yeah, because Why? because even though that I, and I'm not I'm not going to say for sure that they never Probably cheat. Probably because um, they want the integrity of their elections. No, uh, and especially that we know in our countries in Latin America they cheat in many things. So of course they want to make it difficult for people. Not difficult. Let's, let's not put the, the word difficult. But they want to make it right. And if you really are Colombian, and if you really are 18 years old, and so you need to show proof that you are from there and you need to prove so you mean Lena, we have something that we and she's from colombia too Hidalgo's own she knows country has yes. voter rules well, exactly. imagine that. we have voter rules and <laughs> let me tell you something we don't have such a thing of early voting it's only the day of elections and period so people go and it's and they take it serious and make people make lines to go and vote what is wrong with that? Nothing is wrong with that. And you and you need to show something that we call the cedula, which is the ID or the driver right. license. Over there is is the driver license is just to, to drive. But we have the cedula is, is like the yes. ID. And that's a specific ID to vote, like to in vote. Me like in Mexico. Correct. You have to have Correct. an ID issued by the government yeah. to be eligible to vote. No such a thing that bring a bill. Imagine just bring that. a bill with your name and your address and you can vote. Like no. No, and she is from Colombia, and she knows that we have. She knows a better. Of course, she knows better. We oh. have a strict rules. Okay, okay. Well, well, to to that point. So one of the other items was, and this is something that was really troublesome, was uh, that there was a, um, a a disparity. There was almost like a dual track between in person voting and mail in voting, uh, and uh, so uh, obviously the majority of the people vote. Uh, in person. And when you go in person, as uh, Andrea said, you actually have to show ID and, you know, and show that, hey, this is, you know, this is me and uh, I'm an eligible voter uh, and I'm allowed to vote. So the problem with uh, the mail-in ballot that we saw in this last election is actually um, uh, uh, twofold. Number one, that uh, counties uh, election departments, uh, and I'm speaking specifically here of Harris County as, as one of the main um, perpetrators of this, basically took it upon themselves to um, uh, independently send out mail-in ballot applications, even though uh, people did not request it. So that's a problem. Um, uh, uh, you know, mail-in voting occurs for people who are um, over the age of 65, and also uh, for if you are unable to vote on uh, in the election, you know, during the election period. Right. And you're uh, and, and you're out of the county. So you have to. Have right. Exactly. Other than in other words, if you're working in San Antonio, they will gladly mail you a ballot to a Bear County address. Or if you're in Germany, there they will mail you a ballot to Germany in plenty of time so that you can mail it back. That's how early right. voting and mail-in ballot votes. It's it's an accommodation for those, and especially the military, that are away from home and can't come to the ballot box. So, right. you know, Rafa, and, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was, but so the important point is that that has to be requested, right? And it shouldn't be up for the counties to voluntarily mail out literally hundreds of thousands of mail-in applications because uh, it, it, that just provides a lot of loose applications out there that anybody can pick up and that anybody can start, you know, uh, which putting we in know, which, we, which we know they, they have an army that goes and harvests those ballots by mail. Right. So that's point number one. And then the other point, and then, and then, and, and then you can continue is that um, the other problem with mail-in voting is that there was no proof of the person uh, that uh, that the person that is applying is actually the person uh, that is the uh, qualified voter. So this law and this this was a, a you know a real to do that the Democrats did not like, and that's one of the reasons that they basically ran away from their duties uh, was that. It, this new law requires that uh, you that the voter put down uh, at, at least a, at the very least a driver's license to uh, help identify that the person that is sending in the mail in uh, voter application is the is indeed that person so that there can be some sort of 
tracking uh, mechanism. And, uh, and, and that's very important. And we have to show ID in person. So this actually um, it, 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 it unifies that requirement between in, uh, in-person voting and mail-in voting and being able to at least identify, you know, to properly identify the person who is voting. Uh, okay, we're, we're running and, out of and time. And I'm going to add something. I'm going to add something that is from Colombia also. Right. And uh, I don't know in the new ones because I haven't been in my country for 25 years. But back in the time. Why? When I, did they ban you? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I have, my, I have my parents here. So, but back in my time, the cedula, which is the ID, it's even showing your fingerprint. Imagine So that. even she knows better. She knows better. So well, like that's I said, hypocrisy. Alina Hidalgo is not acting independently. This young lady had absolutely no government experience whatsoever. She didn't even know what the Astrodome in Houston was. She's being led by Washington consultants who want to create mayhem in our electoral process. Of course she knows better. Mm -hmm. She's seen the mayhem in her own country. She's seen how Colombia tries to preserve the integrity of their elections. And so she knows better than that. So that's why we wanted to highlight the falsehoods of what she's claiming. Now, one last question on voters in Texas. Uh, will you make us a promise, Rafa, to monitor any complaints of any Texan, of any, any uh, ethnicity, any, any sex, any, you know, age, if they have been denied the right to vote in Texas, and if you uh, find somebody in Texas that has been denied the right to vote, would you please let us know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And because we want to make sure that, you know, the voting process is a sacred process and it should be uh, one with uh, integrity and that everybody who's eligible to vote and, uh, and is a qualified voter should be, able, should be able to vote. All right. Let's move on uh, because we're running out of time. The next issue that she complained about, you know, she talked about um, that, that, you know, the, the, the laws are not extreme enough for her. That means they're not far left enough. So she took issue with the constitutional carry. Now, let me explain. In Texas, uh, we honor the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution which the Supreme Court of the United States has said that it gives the citizens of the United States that don't have a felony conviction or are not mentally incapacitated the right to carry and bear arms. Let me repeat that. That is a constitutional right for the Democrats that don't like this. And so Texas had a system uh, in the past, many, many, many years ago, before Senator Jerry Patterson introduced what was called concealed carry legislation back in the 90s. In the past, the penal code said you can't have a firearm on your person unless there was one defense. It was called the traveling defense. That means if you were going from San Antonio, Bear County, to Harris County, you were allowed to carry a firearm. Or it was in your home, in your possession, on your private property for your defense. That was the only reason that you could carry a firearm. Then Jerry Patterson passed the concealed handgun license where Texans were allowed to submit their fingerprints, submit to a background check, go to a firing range, pass an examination. You would be issued a permit like a driver's license, mm -hmm. Andrea, but it said uh, 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 concealed handgun license. With your picture. With your picture. It's just like a driver's license. And so that worked well, extremely well. I think we've had it for 15 years. Well, then the legislature, because there was a movement around the country that citizens shouldn't ask the government if they're law-abiding citizens and they've never been convicted of a felony, they don't need to ask permission of government to own a firearm because the Constitution already gives us that right. And so Texas passed a law that's called constitutional carry. That means that not everybody can carry a gun. If I'm sure if you're under 18, if you're a child, you can't carry a gun. If you're a felon with a violent criminal background, you can't carry a gun. If you've been declared mentally incapacitated by a you know, family court judge, you can't carry a gun. Uh, so, but if you're a law-abiding citizen who's never broken the law, you're, you can carry a firearm in Texas. 
and that's the way it is in many other states in the United States. So am I far off the mark or is that how you understand it, Rafa? No, absolutely 100% correct. You know, uh, and uh, for many of us believe that that right was already granted to us by our founding fathers in the Constitution uh, gotcha. and, and, and enshrined in the Second Amendment. Uh, and see, and, yes, go ahead. No, go ahead. And, and well, what I was just going to say is um, because, you know, Andrea, you know, the Democrats are all like befuddled uh they're dumbfounded why latinos in texas and tejanos in texas are voting for the conservatives because you know with almost 50 percent of the population in the near future being tejanos mexicanos latinos right mm -hmm. you know a lot of them are rural people down in south texas you know one of the biggest industries is hunting tejanos are big hunters they don't want to ask the government for permission to carry a firearm they don't want to have to ask the government for permission to protect themselves against drug smugglers and human smugglers i can hear somebody speaking in the background. Uh, yeah can we mute him uh anyway sorry about that just some technical issues uh so so you know w Tejanos love the right to carry as long as you're not a criminal. So that's 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 an issue that's been a winning issue for conservatives. Absolutely. And yeah. And can, let's talk about the critical race theory that uh, that uh, Miss Hidalgo also brings up, because that's also very concerning. and It's also very insulting to many of us. Um, uh, so go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so let's get into that. We have about two minutes. Critical race theory. Everybody's wrapped around the axle about this because, you know, the people on the right believe that the schools now are going to teach that the Western Europeans, the Caucasians, the whites that, you know, began to explore this continent were pillagers of the natives and they killed everybody and, you know, then they enslaved the African Americans, and this whole country was built on the back of the Chinese, uh, you know, sweat labor that we imported. I mean, it, it, it's an effort by the left to pit people against people, uh, and so that's what the you know, that's what the argument's about. And, and so what we have done is we have politicized public education as if public education wasn't already weak enough in texas hell you look at urban areas they can't graduate kids they can't graduate urban minorities and now the adults at the school board are fighting about you know you got to teach kids that white people are bad that cops are bad I know. right I know. you that's, know that's crazy you know. And, and so that's the fight what you know folks here's what we're trying to do in texas the conservatives Let's just teach the real history. Let's just talk about what really happened. It, can we talk about the conflicts between the Comanche and the U.S. Cavalry? Of course. Can we talk about denying the vote to African Americans and Mexicanos and Tejanos? Of course. You know, let's talk about real history the way it was. But let's not brainwash our children to believing that African Americans are bad people. Or that, you know, Caucasians are bad people. Or the police are bad Or the police bad are people. bad. Mm -hmm. Or that U.S. soldiers defending our liberties abroad are bad people. That's brainwashing. And so that's what the fight's about. Because especially, you know, these kids are the ones that are going to be the, the future politicians. They're going to be the future president of this country. And so we are uh, raising what kind of people? Well, interestingly, Andrea, when you when you and I talk to Latinos across the state mm -hmm. of Texas, I can tell you guys, and this is where the Democrats are missing all this. And by the way, Texas Monthly came out with a great article this week about, you know, how stunned the Democrats and the liberals are that Latinos are voting conservative. We love this country. And um, because we are conservatives. We love this state. And when you guys try to trash our military, and when you guys try to trash our law enforcement and first responders, when you guys try to trash our border patrol officers that are 90% Latinos on the border trying to save our country, we get it. We get it. We get what you're doing. And you're trying to destabilize our country. And so that's why Latinos in Texas are moving in droves to vote for conservatives. Do conservatives always have the greatest policies? God, no. The Republican Party here in Texas has made tremendous mistakes, as have the Democrats. But we as conservatives put family, liberty, freedom, mm -hmm. free markets, 
ahead of anything else, and that's why the Democrats are losing Latinos in Texas. Because we are coming to this country, Orlando, for better opportunities. We are running away for exactly what is going on in this country, and we don't want to see this country to become that that we're running away for. Right. So, Rafa, thank you. Uh, we love having you. Uh, for those of you that want to know more about the Texas Public Policy Foundation, they have a website. It's Texas Public Policy Foundation. It is a nonpartisan, as I understand, Rafa can correct me if I'm wrong, a conservative uh, sort of think tank that helps the public and the legislature work through issues uh, from, from, from a freedom-loving, a free market-loving, uh, you know, position, not an extreme left position. Am I right or wrong, Rafa? Absolutely right, uh, and we're actually the uh, the the oldest uh, think tank and the most prestigious think tank here in the state of Texas. Uh, we've been around for a little over thirty years, and uh, and we're going to be here for a lot longer, finding conservative solutions to the problems that face everyday Texas. Thank you, Rafa. Rafa. Before you before you leave, call to action to our community. Call to action to everything that is going on in this country. We need to not only be vigilant, but we need to be active. And, and that's exactly what a call to action is. And that when we see that the people from the left trying to change, fundamentally change our society and trying to make us victims and trying to make us feel guilty, we need to stand up and we need to say that that's not correct. Okay. And that we cannot allow, you know, this country was based on a, a principle of limited government not an all-powerful government. And so we need to stand up and we need to make sure that this is a government for and by the people, not a government or government elites. Excellent. Thank you. And we're going to move down the I-35 corridor. To, we're going to go Rafa. down to Bear County, uh, which is San Antonio. And we have the pleasure of having a dedicated uh, public servant. And I say that with all due respect to John Lujan, who has served in the Bear County Sheriff's Office. He fought for the people and the safety of Bear County and San Antonio residents as a firefighter for 25 years. He fought for the fire department and first responders to ensure that they had the equipment necessary to deliver a good service to those in need in San Antonio. And now he wants to continue his service in Texas as a candidate in a special election which is coming up in a few weeks in San Antonio for Texas House District 118. Am I correct, John? You are correct. And, and hey, before we get started, Orlando, I want to say thank you to you and Andrea and Rafa. I know Rafa. I'm, I caught the tell end. And Andrea, you and Orlando got me fired up with uh, the things you're saying. <laughs> you're right. There's, there's so many things that people are judging the Hispanic and the Latinos by, like, oh, why are they doing this? But you're right. You hit it right on the head. We care about the border. We care about our safety. We, these are issues that are near and dear to us. And if you don't mind, I, don't, I know you probably have some things, but I do want to share with you because it goes right in line with that is that I've been getting a lot of phone calls um, because they put my my personal cell number on one of the flyers that went out to the district, which is good. But all these people are calling me and they're very, very upset about the, the attempts to defund the police. And these are all in the Hispanic community. All of them are saying that. So that, that's a huge misconception that Latinos are, you know, that we're just all Democrats and that, and that we, you know, those things aren't important to us. The military, safety of our families, the, the nuclear family, those are all near and dear to Latinos. And the ability for us to work and provide for our family a, a strong economy with job opportunities and a good education for the future of our children are also very important issues to us. Yes, they are. You know, uh, I'm uh, just to let the viewers know, I, I'm a, I've been married 37 years. I have five boys. Um, and wow. right now, this special election just came up. Leo Pacheco resigned. The election is on the 28th of this month. So next Monday... Early voting starts. So early voting is Monday through Friday of next week, and then the 28th. Uh, and to give you a little history, in 2015, we had about the same situation, a special election. Uh, Representative Farias resigned, and I was the first Republican ever elected to this seat in the history of Texas. And uh, that was an honor. And then right after that, we had uh, the I didn't win the general election. 
And I think this time it could be different. That straight ticket voting, I think really, really hurt a lot of us. I, 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 in Orlando, it's imprinted in my brain. I had a, an elderly Hispanic lady come out. She said, me, who, and she put both hands on my face. And she goes, me, who, I wanted to vote for you so bad, but I didn't like Donald Trump, so I had to vote Democrat. And she right. you know, walked away and said, no, 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 gracias. And I just, I felt bad, I, but how am I gonna tell her? No, you could have done this or that, but it was already too late. But, but I think that's the mentality of a lot of the people when they would yeah. vote Democrat. Now we don't have that, that's gonna make a difference. Yeah, unfortunately that's, that's a mentality and we need to encourage our people, our Hispanic community that, um, you know, this thing is nothing to do with Donald Trump, either you like it or not, it's nothing to do with him. It's, it's, it's a lot to do with our kids, with our families, with our communities, with our security. Look at the, the crime rate, it's going crazy. And people are saying defund the police when we're seeing every single day getting worse and worse. And I'm sure in the district um, 118 that you're running for, it's, it's not different than here in Harris County and Houston. Right. And you hit it right on the, the head, Andrea. It's not about Trump or the higher up, right? It's all about control here local. I'm, I'm vested in my community. In fact, right now I run my football league for the little kids. I have 80 something boys on the team. I have some 40 something cheerleaders. I have an enclosed trailer I take to practice every day. Then all of a sudden the election came up. I don't think I'd be coaching if I was running for election, but I said, no, I'm going to do it. I'll power my way through these things because I truly, truly care about our community. And, and you're right. Uh, when I see people standing in front of police officers, cursing them, no respect and, and filming, and that's becoming the norm, that's scary. You know, if that would have been my child, I would have grabbed him by the back of the collar. I would have spanked him there in front of the police officer and I would have told him to arrest him. We don't, t Hispanics, we don't tolerate that, but we're allowing these things to happen. It's indoctrinating our children and it's getting worse and worse. Uh, John, I'm going to share something with you. I'm, I'm, I'm from Colombia and in my country, we don't, people don't respect the police. And the reason that they don't respect the police because it says a lot of corruption and we call it the mordida. So you have to pay them something if they uh, stop you for uh, any uh, traffic incident. And when I came here, I always said like, wow, here is like, if a police stop you, I was like oh, shaking, you know, you're afraid but because you respect them. And now seeing what is going on, you know, I've been here in this country for 25 years, seeing this, that people don't respect the police. When I came to this country and I was like looking at a police officer, I'm such as respect. And if you call 911 and you know that they showed up right away and they take care of things. And now it's a totally different situation. And it's really sad because I'm running away from that horrible uh, country of corruption. I mean, my country is beautiful, but the corruption is horrible and seeing this happening in this country, we need to do something to stop this because I love this country. I'm a U.S. citizen. I'm raising kids. I'm raising a family in this country. And, and it's so sad to see this. And, uh, I will say one thing, Andrea, you're from Colombia. My son just, my two boys live in Costa Rica. They're IT professionals and, and, uh, and they bought a, a, a condo in uh, Costa Rica. And then my oldest son, I don't know what city, but he bought something in Colombia. But when I told him that I was running for office, one of them came two weeks ago and the other one came two days ago. And they're both helping me on the campaign and then they'll go back to Costa Rica. I think my my 32 year old is going to be marrying a tica. So she's going to be coming over here in a couple of weeks and, and also getting at the last leg of the campaign. But you're right. Beautiful countries over there. But man, you know that to have our law enforcement, I think what you know what I would love to see some type of curriculum or something in our schools you know you talked about this critical race theory it's destroying future generations man we need to swing that other way and have a curriculum that shows respect and honor to, to our police officers and to those in authority because when you do that then you have better people you know i just i i don't understand it and, and the people i don't know what force is or wh how why it's happening or what's behind it but unless we get good godly men and women involved in politics we'll never make changes my biggest thing right now is I, when i speak to pastors and churches is you play church so much at your house i mean in, in, in god's house but when you leave you leave the church there you don't take it with you you're not out making a difference in the community and we need to do that that's the only way we're going to make change in this country you know john i didn't want to politicize this too much but that reminds me you know it's sort of like uh 
you know, the churches are good about talking about the gospel and Christian values. You know, if you're Christian or Jewish values or, you know, if, if you're Hindu or if you're Muslim. But, uh, uh, you know, we just passed a bill that sort of fortifies uh, the laws with respect to abortion in an effort to preserve life. And, and our own county judge, Lina Hidalgo, has made a video, and we're not going to talk about it right now much, and we're not going to show it. But she's talking about, you know, again, how the conservatives turned the hands of the clock back, and we want to go back to the days where women had to get abortions in back alleys with coat hangers, and they died. You know, what? again, it's obvious that this is a conservative state that wants to preserve human life. We want to preserve the life of the mother. We want to preserve the life of the child. And, 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 and so while abortion is now legal, according to the United States Supreme Court, uh, because they have declared that Roe v. Wade, uh, you know, that the woman has a right to make a, so a selection as to whether or not to carry the fetus, which as you know, I'm Catholic, I'm conservative, I don't call it a fetus, I call it a human life. But nonetheless, Texas, through its elected representatives, passed a more strict uh, legislation with respect to abortion. So, you know, but Lena Hidalgo talks about, oh, you know, a woman who may get an infection from a back alley abortion, but she never talks about the hundreds of millions of babies that have been aborted and killed. I mean, to me, that's just unacceptable. It's totally unacceptable, and I and I think that there goes back to the perception of the of the of the Latino community, right? Yeah, Orlando, they think we're, we're, we're they people. think they think that we you, you routinely abort our children when actually, you know, uh, Hispanics love family, children and uh, yes. y, y nietos, you know, are number one, and so, but but, but you know these extremes, it's crazy. Those, those, are, those are extremes. You know, I was. I just right before I got on your show, I had a, a call with the uh, the Alliance for Life. I was endorsed by the Alliance for Life, and and uh, I was just talking to them. And, and really, I, you know, they're trying to meet me. And, and and this is no kidding, no joking, or no pretending. But I was really took that opportunity to thank them for the fights that they do for the unborn, for the babies that are that that are being killed. I, I'm telling them, thank you so much for making those stands, taking the hits, and doing that. And I was sincere about that. And I thought after I hung up, I thought, man, they called to interview me and talk to me and tell me that, that I had their endorsement. And I wanted to really take this time to thank them for what they do. But I think I'm just I, I'm not anything special. I just think I'm a typical family man. I have those values, right? Those Hispanic values are really tight on family. And for them to take the notion that uh, I, don't, I, I don't understand how some of our some of our people are, are that hard on the left and a Democrat, they just don't know. And, and But once they get to see this, and I think that's why my race is so crucial uh, coming up to the 28th, because I wanna be a, a, I wanna be a beacon in, in darkness to, to share values, not to be far right or crazy or not to be far, you know, definitely not on the left side, but I wanna be right there and say, these are the facts. This is who we are. This is what we, we get for a better community. This destroys us. Critical race theory, all these things they're trying to put down our throat. That destroys us. When you when you knock the nuclear family, that destroys us. And history has shown that. John, this special election is very important, but not only that, we always hear that TLC are encourage people to vote for local government because we are paying attention so much for the presidential race and I know it's very, very important too. But you know, daily basis is where we get impacted by the local by the local runs, by the local officers, by the local people like you. So tell us a little bit more about this special election. What is your platform and what are you looking for? Okay, you know, I'm going to start off by the last part. What am I looking for? I would like for everybody to go to votelujan.com. If you go to votelujan.com, you can get in there and you can uh, volunteer. We're having rallies to block walk. I, I'll, tell, I'll tell you both, I am super blessed. I didn't never thought that I would have this much support, funding, and it's allowing me to get out there and, and do the things that I do. When I say blessed, also in the fact that, you know, you mentioned I was a deputy sheriff, you know, I was I was a, a, a firefighter for 25 years, 
And then I, I would still be a firefighter. I retired about seven, eight years ago because my company grew too big. I have a technology company. We started with three people in 1999. Seven, eight years ago, we were like 200 employees. Today, we're close to 600 employees. My, my paperwork says 400, but they're the, the, the numbers wrong. But I have all this knowledge. And so I pray real hard, God, you know, I have this knowledge. Give me the wisdom to use this knowledge to serve the community. And because I have, I'm, I'm, I'm settled with my business and stuff, I took off these next few weeks. I go in the office every now and then two, three times a week just to make sure everybody's working. And then I, uh, and they do, I got good people. And then uh, I, I'm getting out there and I'm block walking. I changed this shirt just for you. I had a red t boat Luhan t-shirt because we we're, we're getting ready to go block walking my family and I today. And there's a group out block walking right now. But that's what it takes. It's going to take, it's going to take patriots that want to, have a conservative government that we can't just sit back and hope for conservative government. We got to get involved to create a conservative government and to keep a conservative government here in Texas. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm inspired when I when I'm on a, a podcast like Texas Latino Conservatives. I'm this inspires me to say, hey, you know what? I got to get out there and I got to block or I got to do my part. I can't just sit back and say, okay, everybody vote for me. I got to get there and and do these things and get out there with the folks that are out there right now, block walking. So, uh, John, what are, uh, uh, Andrea asked, but what are some of the specific issues in the district? As I understand, the district is uh, south of I-10, and there's a little sliver of the district that goes kind of the northeast part, just north of I-10, but the bulk of the district kind of straddles the southern part of San Antonio. Is that correct? And into Bear County? Yes, it goes uh, from south all the way from Somerset, Texas. If you're familiar with the area, that's more of the eastern part. I mean, the western part of my district, all south into uh, the, the city, heavy Hispanic population there in McCollum, Harlandale area. And then it goes East Bear County and then up through. Uh, so the, the, the district is very diverse. Uh, one of the big things that, that really, really prompted me to run the first time, and it's still a major issue right now, is our school districts. We have some of the South districts, when I was, when I first got elected in that special election, I called all the superintendents together. I have like 13, 14, I got to get the number down, but a bunch of school districts in, in the 118, all the way from up North and down South. But we had, at, when I was elected the first time, we had three failing school districts. That's not acceptable. And, and when they try to rebuild, the state actually came in and took over two of them and they were projecting two or three years to build back up. I'm thinking, what if my child's in that school for two to three years while you're building up so my child misses out two, three? That's not acceptable. And to keep that going on and nobody's doing nothing, nobody's putting round tables together. I don't claim to have the answers, but if I bring the superintendents together, find out what's best practices, why are we failing, how do we fix these things, that's what needs to be done. The second thing we need, especially in our South area, is um, is job creation. Uh and I'm a firm believer that we can break cycles of poverty by teaching technology. And not only do I say that, but we're doing that. You know, they make fun of me at work. We have a, we run this whole help desk for this big oil and gas company. And every time there's an opening, they say, oh, they got an opening. John's going to go find a kid from the South side to save him. I said, well, of course, man, we got to give them opportunities. You know, what do you want them to break in your house or something? We got to. And so we have actually seen lives changed because they're learning good technologies. And then not only that, they stay with me for a year or two, and then they come to me real sad, Mr. Nolan, I got a better offer with this organization. The man, go, me go. And then boom, we bring in someone else. And and we have many success stories like that. But we need to have somebody that, that can do some job creation on the South Side. I'm really proud that when I was thinking of running, when they called me, Pete Flores was the first one to call me. And everybody started calling me. And I kept telling everybody, no, 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 I'm not going to run. And they say, no, this opportunity. One of the first ones to call me was a, the South Side Chamber of Commerce. And they said, John, we need you. We need a businessman. You know, your ideas, your things that you do. You work. And this is the president of the greater chamber encouraging me to run. Um, and then after all, I said, I do. So the, the education and, and definitely uh, uh, job creation. And the other one is public safety. We've got to make sure that our firefighters and our police officers are equipped. And then as a state rep, I would love to be part of something. To, I love that deal about putting some type of curriculum in the early grades that teaches respect and honor of those in authority. That's biblical, that's biblical. We do those things and we get blessed. You start fighting and cursing, what are you gonna get? You get anything positive out of that? But you do respect and honor, the blessings come from that. 
John, everything that you said fell in education, in like fall in education. Everything and the key of everything is education because that's what we're being uh, hurt the most in the education. You know, the problem that you're having in the in the District 118 is the same problem that we're facing here in Harris County and it's the same problem that not only Harris County and not only your district, but I think everywhere in the country, education. And if we're not attacked that directly, forget about it. You're right. And, and uh, you know, I'll give you a quick little story. I speak at different high schools. Whenever I'm asked to speak, I'll speak, especially on technology and stuff. I spoke at the Southside High School, a big auditorium to a bunch of kids promoting technology and stuff. And I have this little PowerPoint and I do this whole uh, dog and pony show. And afterwards people go, Mr. Lujan, that was good. I want to get in technology or I like computers, all just basic stuff. And I'm thinking, okay, I went to the North side uh, at Clark High School. This is a nice high school. And uh, I did the same speech, everything the same. And some guy comes up to me and says, Mr. Lujan, great job. He gives me a business card. He goes, I'm a senior right now at this school, and I have my own, I do back-end database work. He starts talking, I said, man, do you do Oracle? And he goes, no, but I do PL SQL, and I do this and that, so I can pick up Oracle real easy because I use uh, uh, all these other databases, and they're all about the same. He knew the language, and I said, who does the front-end for you work? And he goes, oh, that'd be uh, Bobby. Bobby, come here. Give Mr. Lujan your card. These are high school students. Tell me who's got an advantage in the workplace. My Southside kids, they weren't having any of that, and so... How do we instill that and get those things? You have to have people, you have to have a representative that's not going to tolerate just this, this, just the status quo, but we've got to do those things out of the box so that these kids can learn and be prepared for these pay, high paying jobs of tomorrow. You know, John, that, that brings up an interesting point because I wholeheartedly agree with you. We believe, Andrea and I and Texas Latino conservatives believe that a solid quality education and retention in the public schools for our minority kids and our Latino kids is important for the future of the state of Texas. And as you said, you had some failing schools in your district in the southern portion of San Antonio. We have five failing schools in Houston, and they're all in the minority African-American Hispanic community. Uh, several years ago, uh, Andrea was with me. I held a press conference in front of the Houston Independent School District in which I was attacked by the left when I called for the governor once and for all to take over the failing schools in Texas and in Harris County and in Houston. I mean physically attacked. And wow. uh, so this is what the left wants to preserve. They're fighting. They say, oh, no, we want local control. We elected a dysfunctional board. This is the choice of the people. Well, we're not trying to remove school board members. We're just saying, uh, and this is legislation passed by an African-American state representative that said if schools fail for several years, the state has a right to come in, kind of like bankruptcy, and administer the failing school until we can rehabilitate it for the future of these children, for the future of the taxpayers, and for the future of the state of Texas. I was physically assaulted because the left wants failing schools. And so what I tell Latino parents is, guys, you got to get involved. You got to take a few minutes once in a while and show up to your school board meeting and fight for your children. Don't accept that the highest tax rate that you have on your home is your school district in Texas. Let me repeat that. The biggest tax you pay is to the public school. And yet some of you are in failing school districts. Can you and you're imagine? okay with it. Can you imagine? And, yeah, and, and, and the left is okay with it. Most parents aren't, but they don't know what to do. So right. Latinos, get up. Pick up the pitchfork. Grab the shovel. You know, go fight for your children. If you're in a failing school district, demand that the state of Texas improve the quality of edu education. And for those watching us that are conservatives in Austin, you have a duty as a state representative, as a senator, to improve the quality of urban public education in Texas. Do not abandon the investment that we need to make in the future because the children have different skin tones. Invest in education because every child, whether they're African-American, Asian, Latino, immigrant, native-born, deserves a right 
a chance to compete in the economy of this country. So I hope that's a message that resonates in the Southern District, uh, in, in District 118 in San Antonio. We're extremely proud of you, John, for abandoning your work, your family, your you know little league sports to go represent your district because you're passionate and you love the people of san antonio all i can tell you guys that are watching us in san antonio is go out and support this man he deserves your vote uh, the election is coming up early voting starts monday we at texas latino conservatives have proudly endure, endorsed john lujan uh, for texas house of representatives we're going to be on the ground helping him, block walking with him. Uh, we're going to be uh, advertising for him. So, John, make an appeal to your neighbors in San Antonio of why, one more time, they need to get out starting Monday and vote for you. Yes, uh, thank you so much. First of all, thank you all for this opportunity. Thank you for the service that you guys are providing to, to the great state of Texas. This is important. What you guys do is, is really, really important. For me, I, man, if you guys can go to votelujan.com, uh, ask for a yard sign, uh, click on there to volunteer. We have an event coming up Saturday. We'll have all the information on the website. We got a rally where we're going to go block walking. I want to thank that our local chapter of the Texas Latino Conservative, Conservatives have been so, so supportive and helpful to me in my campaign. And I'm so blessed to have you guys with us. And uh, together we can make a change. Together we make a difference. But we have to get out and work. John, and, 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 uh, and, and, please and, repeat the dates of the early voting and the and the election day. Early voting will be next Monday, the 20th through the 24th. And then election day will be September 28th. And John, um, one thing, you are endorsed by the firefighters of San Antonio. Is that correct? Yes, I was very, very excited. The San Antonio Firefighter Association uh, offer their endorsement. They're going to send some block walkers out helping me. The guys are, um, you know, I'm, I'm so honored. You know, it, I'm honored because they know what I stand for. They, they, they know what I've done, um, that it, not only as, as a person and in the community, but also as a firefighter and the, a lot of good stories, you know, and I'm just blessed to have them, their endorsement. It means so much to me. Well, I got to tell you, uh, as a person that was endorsed by the Houston firefighters many years ago when I served on the Houston City Council, and when I ran for mayor, and I've seen the firefighters work political campaigns in Harris County and in Houston, they're winners, they're fighters. They know, they know how to engage, they know how to get involved. So I wanna congratulate the uh, professional firefighters of San Antonio for endorsing your campaign. I hope the firefighters get uh, uh, out on the weekend and help you block walk. And we look forward to meeting some of the San Antonio firefighters. And by the way, John, uh, we're going to be in San Antonio with Leadership Latino, what, November 6th? November 6th uh, for Leadership Latino. So we're hoping that you get elected and we're hoping that November 6th you come back and are a speaker in our Leadership Latino class, which is where we take young people and try to make them the next conservative leaders in the state of Texas. So we're looking forward to that. I would be honored to do that. And I would give you, I don't even have to look. I'll clear the calendar. I'm there. If you put me there, God willing, I'm, I win uh, September 20th. I'm supposed to say I am going to win, right? That's what my campaign tells me. You are winning. So I'm going to win uh, September 28th. And I would be honored to be there and encourage others because that's how we make change. You guys are on the lines. Thank you. All right, John. Well, well God to bless. us, you are already a winner because you are the voice for the community and the voice for the Latinos, and we are so proud of you. So before the elections day, you are already a winner. So, John, thank you thank for you. Uh, taking the time out. Go back and block walk because block walking is important. That's how you get votes. Uh, I did it before. I ran for the Texas House of Representatives, and I blocked walked extensively, and it pays off. So we look forward to seeing you in San Antonio. And folks, don't forget, John Lujan, in a special election, uh, early voting starts in San Antonio on Monday, and he could use your help. If you can make a donation to the John Lujan campaign, it's a short window, but please do so. Go to his website and make a donation. If you can volunteer for John, even if it's for two hours, walking your neighborhood in your precinct in the uh, District 118 in the southern part of San Antonio to make sure that John gets elected, please do so. Uh, so get involved. This is your opportunity. 
Uh, you know, as Andrea said earlier, everybody gets wrapped around the axle about voting for president of the United States. But when was the last time you saw the president of the United States or called him or her up for anything? Probably never. But I bet you do call your local representative uh, for help. And so get involved. Help John. He's working hard for you. 30 plus years, uh, married, family man, entrepreneur, public servant. Uh, Bear County Sheriff, uh, San Antonio Firefighter. I mean, what more could you ask for? Yeah. Así que... Que salgan a votar. Que salgan a votar. La, a, votaciones anticipadas empieza septiembre 21 hasta el 24 y la, el día de elecciones es septiembre 28. Así que vayan a votar y apoyar al candidato de su distrito porque pues de verdad las, las elecciones locales son muy importantes. Lo, Lo que tú dices, importante. presidente, sí es muy importante, pero con quien lidiamos todos los días y quien nos impacta nuestra vida diaria son realmente nuestros representantes locales. Ok, no se, no se olviden que vamos a estar en el Rio Grande Valley, en la zona de Cameron County, Hidalgo County, con Leadership Latino. Si tienen interés, quieren matricularse, vayan a leadershiplatino.com. We'll be down in the Rio Grande Valley if you want to register That's for October our class. 2nd. We have about 40 young people. I think we're going to wow. get the next Mayra Flores. We're going to get the next Dan Corrales. We're going to get the next uh, Roman Garcia out of this class. We're so excited down in the Rio Grande Valley Leadership Latino where we teach you all that you need to know about running for office or becoming a conservative activist in Texas. And then we look forward to being in San Antonio November, November 6th. the 6th. Así que... Go to our website, TexasLatinoConservatives.com. That's where all is. And I'm going to toss it to Andrea to say goodbye to you guys. Nos vemos también en TexasLatinoConservatives.com y también ingresen a LeadershipLatino.com para que se puedan inscribir para las dos clases que tenemos el próximo octubre 2 y también noviembre 6. Octubre 2 es en Río Grande Valley y, y noviembre 6 es en San Antonio. Así que nos vemos pronto and we see you guys next Wednesday. Bye bye. Bye.